Again, good morning. My name is Peter Siegel from Digital Transitions. Um, I want to start today off with a couple housekeeping notes, uh, some technicalities at first. Uh, we have about 200 attendees, so we kindly ask you to turn uh, to mute your microphone. And uh, we also suggest viewing this presentation in full screen mode because there's some uh, imagery that will be going on and you'll have the best visual effect, obviously, if you're in full screen mode. Uh, lastly, uh, not lastly, but next is if you have questions during the webinar, please email Allison at the email address under questions uh, at aaw at digitaltransitions.com. And also, if you have any other questions, uh, you can also reach out to your local cultural heritage dealer if you're not from North America. On today's agenda, um, I, myself, Peter, will talk a little bit about our Division of Cultural Heritage, provide a quick update on the Zoysel Scan Studio, and Dr. Peterson was going to provide uh, the, most of the content of this webinar about why, what, and how regarding integration and automation. So very briefly, DT is about 14 years old. And as a company, we have two divisions. And the main offices are in two physical locations, one in New York City and another one in Los Angeles. We have over 19 specialized staff spread across the U.S. in Texas, California, Maine, Pennsylvania, New York, and Denver. And we started our Division of Cultural Heritage about 11 years ago uh, to better serve the cultural heritage community. We did this primarily because we felt that uh, commodity-based cameras weren't really satisfying the Herculean staff uh, the, I'm sorry, the Herculean task that uh, cultural her heritage staff members had to accomplish. Um, so as you can see here, we, we've made a, a large swath of imaging benches to satisfy the needs of your holdings. And we make specialized hardware and software to help digitization efforts around the world. And as you can see, what's slightly highlighted there is uh, a new device that we've been working with phase one on for the past couple of years to make a better reprographic camera. Quick update on Zoichel. The reason why I'm mentioning Zoichel today and how it, how, it, how it makes sense for this conversation is I have a, a new camera system. And Digital Transitions was chosen as the sole dealer to sell the Zoichel Scan Studio. The Scan Studio is Zoichel's newest system that uses both phase one technology and Zoichel's hardware benches. And there's a lot of automated features built into the Zoichel system itself. That system um, will probably be available, I say probably, should be available for demonstration mid-September of this year, about a month plus away. Now on to our webinar. I'm going to hand you over to our very special Doug Peterson, who is our head of product development. Hello everyone, my name is Doug Peterson and today we'll be talking about automation and integration for FAGI four-star digitization applications. And we're going to talk about that in three phases. Why, why we care about automation and integration, what, what specifically we've been doing in the last couple of years to improve our automation and integration, and how. How do we make those specific improvements work, that is a live demonstration of those features. And the main point here is because you asked. That's why. The reason why we've made these improvements is because we listen to the marketplace and we do everything we can to host roundtables, encourage direct feedback, go out and ask direct questions to our clients and to our prospective clients about what they should be doing, what we should, sorry, what we should be doing differently to better serve that market. And over and over again, we heard automation integration were high priorities for those institutions. So why do we care about automation integration? Why do institutions care about it? Well, at Digital Transitions, we want to integrate the very best components of a digitization platform to provide a workflow that's simple, consistent, fast, and efficient, and has less drudgery without giving up or sacrificing any image quality, any object safety, or any flexibility. We're going to take a look at each one of these 
But first, I just want to sort of frame the conversation. 10, 15, 20 years ago, the flatbed scanner and legacy scanning devices were what most institutions used for digitization because they were the only option for high resolution capture. Over the last 15 years, the transition to camera-based capture has been stark, has been immediate uh, in the grand scheme of time. However, commodity cameras, commodity benches, unintegrated lighting, when you source all of your components from different vendors and different manufacturers, each of whom are making systems for different reasons and not necessarily for cultural heritage, what you find is a complete lack of automation integration. So we want to provide that integration automation, and we want to do it for these reasons. As we mentioned, simplicity. Specifically, we want to reduce the errors that human beings invoke into the process when the system is too complex or requires too many steps. This is especially helpful for inexperienced operators like volunteers or students, but it's also helpful even for those who have years or decades of experience because the simpler the system is, the less chance you're going to make any sort of error with it. And an automated and integrated workflow is simpler. We also care about consistency. By automating and integrating certain kinds of tasks, computers or hardware or firmware or software can do a more consistent job than can a human being. When we look later at autofocus is an example where even the best trained and most experienced operator doesn't have the ability to control the consistency of focus as closely as a high quality purpose driven autofocus system does. So it reduces variation, natural variation from day to day, natural variation from shot to shot, and therefore decreases QC rejections, which also increases your productivity. We care about automation integration because it makes the workflow faster and efficient. It increases the productivity without adding to the per unit cost. Sometimes such automation integration will cost a little bit more on the front end in, as far as a capital investment goes, but over the course of even a small project, the increase in productivity can often overwhelm that, and over the course of years of digitization, clearly outmatch the cost of any input at the beginning. And finally, we're not automatons, right? We're not automatons. We're not computers. Nobody walks into the office at a digitization facility with a bright smile on their face saying, I can't wait this morning to crop 2,000 or 20,000 or 200,000 images. Cropping and other mundane repeated tasks aren't mentally engaging. They're not personally satisfying. They are simply a monotonous task that has to be done if you don't have a method of automating it. So if we can reduce drudgery tasks, we can also free up time for more engaging tasks, tasks that require and benefit from human intelligence and human engagement. So we want to combine these different components together to provide a workflow that is simple, consistent, fast, and efficient, but we don't want to sacrifice image quality, object safety, or flexibility. Image quality is especially important to digital transitions because our part of the market is preservation imaging. There are many camera com there are many companies who make, for example, feed scanners that provide very fast digitization at a very low quality for applications like office paperwork and content extraction. Our goal is to provide systems that provide preservation grade imaging, and we cannot sacrifice on that goal. Next, object safety. We don't want to sacrifice object safety. For any cinema buffs out there, you might recognize Modern Times from 1936, and it provided a relatively uh, ingenious insight as to the downside of automation when done poorly or when done with something as critical as object safety. There are applications where a acceptable loss might be one in a thousand or one in a million objects during digitization, things like office work or content extraction. If one or two pages are dropped every 100,000 or a million pages, that may not be of much consequence in, uh, for example, extracting the letters and words off the page of a circulation book. But we serve the communities like my museums and libraries and archives and research facilities where even a single damaged or destroyed object is absolutely unacceptable. And so one thing you will not see in this presentation, I, I do not believe as product manager you will see from digital transitions ever, uh, is automation of object handling. There are very good options out there for, uh, there, are op there are companies out there who provide automated object handling in the form of, for example, automatic book, book page turning or automatic feeding from a stack of slides or an automatic feeding from a stack of documents. 
And we, we simply don't believe in that. We believe that object safety is so paramount that the handling needs to be fast, efficient, but it needs to be safe. And it needs to be done, therefore, by hand or with an operator guiding all movement. And finally, we don't want to sacrifice flexibility. As we've moved to camera-based solutions as a community, one of the nice things is that one station can handle both books and film and flat objects. Uh, the DT Atom in particular is, is like that. We have that flexibility. So we don't want to sacrifice that flexibility in pursuit of automation integration, which means we still need to be looking at modular-based systems, systems that have multiple purposes, that you don't end up with one book scanner and one map scanner and uh, one flat scanner and one film scanner. And, and we want to have one system or a small number of systems that can serve a large number of purposes. We don't want to give that up. As we mentioned, this is all in the context of camera-based capture. A normal camera actually has, a normal camera-based digitization platform, say like Lightroom and Canon, uh, that combination doesn't have a lot of automation. It doesn't have a lot of integration. The only automation you're going to see in a system like that tends to be autofocus if and where appropriate. Uh, but as we look at in detail later, autofocus from a commodity camera is often not appropriate for cultural heritage applications. With the Phase 1 IXG uh, currently in the process of launching and being delivered, uh, with the DT Auto column, which we are announcing formally today uh, and which we demonstrated prototypes of at uh, the ALA show. And with Capture One CH, uh, we have, we believe, automated or made preset many of the systems, many of the methods that go from A to Z during digitization, many of the steps in that process. So let's take a look at what those specific improvements are that we've made recently. What have we been doing to improve the automation integration? And that's going to be three main areas, the Phase 1 IXG, the DT Auto column, and Capture 1 CH, providing autofocus, auto PPI, and auto crop, respectively. The Phase 1 IXG. Phase 1 IXG, uh, made by Phase 1 in, in tight coordination with and from strong input from Digital Transitions, provides a litany of new features uh, and improvements over previous culture heritage based cameras or culture heritage uh, intended cameras. But the one we want to focus on today is autofocus. And if you're a normal photographer, if your background is photography, you may be thinking to yourself, well, what the heck? Why in the world is somebody uh, waxing on about a camera having autofocus? We've had autofocus for, for decades. Well, as you're going to see in the live demonstration at the end of today, you've never seen autofocus specifically like this. And the reason is most autofocus systems are designed for general purpose focusing. For example, shooting sports or shooting a bride at a wedding or shooting little kids running around at a family gathering. That sort of autofocus emphasizes speed and movement over accuracy. It also uses, in almost all cases, a separate sensor than the sensor that is, it uses a mechanism for autofocus that is not the sensor being used to capture the final image, which means you often have registration, alignment, or accuracy issues requiring things like micro-adjust or fine-tune. The IXG implements a cultural heritage only autofocus. It emphasizes precision and accuracy over speed. You will probably find never, you'll probably never find another company bragging about how slow our autofocus is. Our autofocus in the IXG takes a solid four or five or six seconds, which is 10 or maybe even 100 times slower than normal general purpose autofocus. But that's because we are doing a binary search pattern on a proprietary algorithm that takes a while to execute in order to sample every possible option down to the smallest step of the motor, which in this case is six microns of accuracy. It is also based directly off of the full resolution direct feed from the actual image sensor. So it could not be based anything, it, it is absolutely based on exactly what the final capture will be made off of. There's no issues of alignment or correlation between the autofocus and the actual image captured. It's also built, like the RCAM, to have no drift in its focus. It is built to point down and to hold the point of focus that you've selected indefinitely, without end, period. If you look at a general purpose camera, it is not a fault of quality of manufacturing or quality of, of uh, engineering. Those cameras are made to point straight out. They're meant to be held by a person pointing out at, for example, a sports game. 
in that orientation, gravity is not affecting the focus itself uh, or affecting it hardly at all if you're, for example, pointed slightly down. In cultural heritage imaging, the most common type of library and archive photography is pointing straight down on a copy stand. And in that scenario, a general purpose camera will either drift or settle. Drifting means a continuous motion. You place it and it continues to move. That is fairly uncommon in higher end cameras. But the other problem you run into is that settling behavior, where even if you place a rubber band or a piece of gaff tape on the focus mechanism, it will settle into the elasticity of that restraining device. It will slowly change a small amount, which in high quality preservation imaging is not acceptable. The IXG is designed to have no drift. And finally, especially for those migrating from an R camera, uh, you'll find the integration of the IXG to be excellent. It is directly controlled within Capture One, both the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, the focus, as well as deploying the shutter itself or triggering the camera. All of that is done within Capture One. And uh, the sales team would be disappointed in me if I didn't mention that we have uh, upgrade programs available for the IXG coming from either the RCAM, HASI, uh, that is Hasselblad, Canon, Nikon, Sony, Zoichel, or just about any other imaging device you have, please contact our sales team and we can arrange for a quote that includes the discount for an upgrade. Next is the DT Auto Column and DT Auto Column XL, two columns in a brand new line of columns that DT produces, uh, which feature, amongst other things, automatic PPI. Automatic PPI means that you can type in a value like 600 PPI and push go, and you will end up at that specific PPI. You don't have to manually control it. You don't have to use a hand controller. You tell the computer what PPI you want to shoot at. It moves the camera accordingly. And that movement is precise. When we're talking about three or 400 PPI, the precision doesn't necessarily have to be that great. If you arrive at a PPI within a couple millimeters, maybe within a centimeter, you're probably within FAGI4 requirements for the 1% precision you need. But on film scanning, you need a much higher level of precision. And one of the reasons why we pursued making the DT Auto column instead of using off-the-shelf columns was because of the extreme fineness of movement it provides. Uh, our column provides movement that is suitable for film scanning. Integration-wise, Auto PPI occurs within Capture One Cultural Heritage, which means you don't have to leave the software. There is no accompanying or side. Uh, uh, there is no other software or physical device necessary to control the column. The, the column, as it comes to you, is able to be plugged into Capture One CH, and you're able to immediately implement Auto PPI. You are also able to control the column manually, whether in a single step or in a faster movement, with an adjustable speed on that movement. That is useful, for example, when you want to frame an object of a specific size and not necessarily a specific PPI, or if you're just one that likes to occasionally, like I do, drive a stick shift car, even though auto might be in some ways easier. We also have a PPI readout. Uh, that is not new in Capture One uh, as far as the image on screen. What is new here is that the column itself will provide you a real-time readout, so even when you're using manual control, you will be able to see the current PPI at all times. That is updated in real time. Uh, I think the, the refresh rate is something like twice per second. The auto column is also, I think, has a distinct advantage over other commodity columns in that it provides an anti-vibration dampening pendulum. This is the same underlying technology or engineering that goes into skyscrapers. Uh, here in our office in Manhattan, we are surrounded by them, and they are kept uh, more stable by implementing a pendulum often at the top of the building. And likewise, our column has an anti-vibration damping pendulum, which will help both eliminate the vibration as it actually is transferred through, and also to cessate large vibration. For example, if you knock into the table with your knee, you can expect that the pendulum uh, will cease that movement or cease that vibration or counter it very, very quickly. Uh, the DT Auto Column and Auto Column XL product line are available on the DT Atom. The DT RGC 180 AC, the DT RG 3040 AC, those are uh, new versions of our existing RGC 180 and RG 3040. The AC there stands for Auto Column. As well as on the DT XY Film Scanner, which has been recently installed and is in use at the Library of Congress scanning the FSA collection, that is also going to be using a DT Auto Column. And as a wall mount, uh, we have previously occasionally done columns with a wall mount. But because of the automatic 
control from Capture One for both the position of the camera and the focus of the camera on the IXG, we are much more comfortable now offering a wall-mounted version of the DT Auto Column or Auto Column XL. Uh, those are two different lengths. We are very comfortable offering those in a wall mount uh, because we can then control them remotely even if the column is fairly high or the camera reaches out of our normal reach as an operator. Auto Column upgrades are available from previous generation columns. So if you are a current DT client, or if you have an uh, existing competitive column from someone else, please contact us and we will see what we can do on an upgrade price for you. We want everybody to be able to have access to these. Capture One CH is a tool that has already been, uh, is already in use at many of our clients' institutions and has a variety or litany of integration automation features. But the one I want to focus on today is Autocrop because Autocrop takes up uh, so much of the slack when it comes to manual drudgery tasks. The autocrop is fast. It can process about 100 files per minute on a fast computer, and it can process about 100,000 overnight uh, should you wish to have a workflow where you have multiple stations capturing and then one station take up slack of autocrop overnight. Uh, we are big fans of using computer time instead of human time wherever possible. So you set up at 5 o'clock, tell it to go, you come back in tomorrow at 9 o'clock, and you will see it's able to do a huge volume of uh, cropping for you. It works off of the raw workflow. So you don't have to have one program for capture, one program for cropping, uh, for automatic cropping, one program for quality control, and then a manual workflow to correct or to uh, redo any missed auto crops. Everything is within the same software. Everything is within Capture One CH. So you can automatically crop, QC, and correct in that same software. Those Fast and raw, those uh, bullet items applied from our very first version of Capture One CH Auto Crop. Here are the three things that are new uh, as of, uh, th that are now new. The pre-pass rule has been implemented, allowing automatic handling of white on white or dark on dark. In previous versions, we had sort of a tedious workaround where you had to click several places in order to handle white on white cropping or dark on dark cropping. Now you can simply indicate to the crop tool that you have a lower contrast situation and it will automatically find the objects. We also added optimization. This is useful especially for legibility if you have objects that have faint or faded typography or uh, writing on them. You will be able to automatically enhance those contrasts, the, the contrast of that object uh, and place that version in just a derivative. For example, you might process out the unadulterated preservation grade unaltered image as a 16-bit TIFF and then process out the contrast enhanced legibility version as a JPEG 2000 or JPEG. It's also immensely useful for digitization of negative film because negative film is not uh, as straightforward as simply capturing what's there. You often need to both invert and then automatically uh, correct the tonality range of the specific capture and the optimized function auto crop in Capture One CH10 now handles that automatically. It does so, by the way, on the interior of the image so that even if you're adding padding, for example, 100 pixels of padding, it will actually look not just at the object, it will look at the interior 90% of the object as to avoid any unusual things, for example, a, a cut or sprocket holes or uh, other things like that that might throw off the automatic nature. And then roll film. If you look in the top left corner here, we have uh, an iPhone picture of a system that we've recently installed at the Getty Research Institute. That is a system that is digitizing fragile or especially valuable real film. And that system is very fast at being able to capture such precious or delicate and fragile material, but it generates just a huge volume of files. If you're capturing a new frame every two to three seconds, and you do that for days on end, you're going to have tens of thousands or over the course of a project, hundreds of thousands or even millions of frames, which require automatic cropping to compensate for slight variations in the position of the film from one frame to the next. For that project, we worked with phase one to develop a new algorithm for the autocrop in Capture One CH that handles that specific use case. It also provides a confidence rating so that if you do 100,000 images, you might find that 99,500 of them have a high confidence, 400 of them have a medium confidence, and 100 have a low confidence. 
that allows you to focus your QC efforts based on the likelihood that there was an issue. The high confidence crops uh, will not need as thorough or as minute of a review, where the low confidence one are almost surely going to require manual recropping. And that allows you to sort by confidence and then quickly place your time where it's most valuable. That can also be used, this new algorithm can also be used for any roll film. So if you're using 35 millimeter or 120 cut into strips and then using our DT film scanning system, uh, our, our normal uh, non-real based film scan system, that will also be of great aid for scanning that type of repeated format film. And there's just a closer look at that system. Uh, we will not be demonstrating that in the live demonstration because we were requested to deliver this with such urgency, we were not actually able to set up a formal photo shoot uh, or have a system here at the office for the demonstration is already being pressed into service. So we've talked about Phase 1 IXG, the DT Auto column, and the Capture 1 CH as being what we've done to improve the automation, but I really would like to uh, move past slide decks and talking and look at these implementations specifically. All right, friends, so I am now here in our studio in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we also have an office in LA where we have the same equipment set up. We're going to do a live demonstration now of the autofocus and auto PPI functions. Uh, these are part of a preview software package uh, we will be releasing here in the next several weeks. Here we have on screen a tool that I've just brought to the center to make it obvious called copy stand. Now what's cool about demonstrating this tool is the simplicity and unifunctionality of it. It shows me where I currently am and allows me to request a new position or new PPI by typing it in and pushing go uh, or pushing move. I was at 800 PPI. I then went to 1,000 PPI, and depending on the quality of your screen sharing and the quality of your internet connection, you would have seen that the initial movement was quite fast. It made a quite fast movement from, say, 800 to 950. It then slowed so that the last bits of movement would be the slowest movement the column can achieve so we can get down to the highest level precision. I'm now going to open up live view, and as anybody who's used uh, a camera-based system knows, after you move the camera, you'll need to refocus the camera, and this would often begin a cycle of Focusing, capturing, confirming focus, tweaking, scratching your head a little bit to ask which one is better, and finally resolving to a specific focus. Instead, I'm going to jump to 100% and I'm going to engage the autofocus, that is the AF button in the focus camera focus tool in Cash 1 CH. Again, notice the length of time being taken. And also notice that the light for autofocus stayed on for two or three seconds later or after the last visible change on screen. The reason for this is that the autofocus sweeps from maximum to minimum and then does a search pattern that phase one has developed, proprietary algorithm that they've developed to arrive to the final focus where the last few steps are the smallest change the camera can make. That means that we're always providing you the maximum accuracy. We're never saying, oh, that's pretty close, that's good enough, just stop. It always goes to the very end. The last movement of the camera is often not visible, even at high PPI, even at 100%, even magnified past 100%. You won't see those last changes taking place, but they are happening and they are fine-tuning that focus so that it is absolutely perfect. Closing live view and capturing, we'll now see the new image shot at that new PPI. We'll jump into one of the ruler markings here for an inch. And we'll see that the resulting PPI is measured as 989. I have a feeling if I go in here and focus uh, even closer in on the item, we 
get an even closer result of 991 PPI. That is within, mental math-wise, a fraction of a percent of the intended value. And now also look at what really matters. Look at the amount of detail we're able to capture off of this engraving. This is done at, quote unquote, only 1,000 PPI. Let's demonstrate the same process again, taking the, the system up to 1,200 PPI. Now I've recaptured at 1200 PPI and zoomed to 400% to demonstrate, again, the speed at which changing PPI, refocusing with absolute precision and certainty, is made substantially faster through the automation that uh, DT and Phase 1 have coordinated together to make in the Phase 1 IXG and Capture CH software. So now we've talked about why, what, and how, but this is the most important part of this webinar. And that is, we are still working on these specific tools that you've seen today. And as well, this is just the beginning. We have many ideas, many of which came from the community, about how we can further automate and integrate our system, make it even simpler without sacrificing much quality, flexibility, or object safety. And we need more of that feedback. So if you have feedback, suggestions, questions, comments after this webinar, please, please email them in to us at info at dtdch.com. Allison, do we have any questions? Um, there is one question that I'm sure everyone's going to be asking about is, um, is this webinar being recorded? And it is. Um, usually it will take a few days for us to get it posted. Um, but when it is posted, we will put it on the website and send an email so everyone knows it's available. So the, the first question is, can the autofocus point be repositioned outside the screen center? It's a fantastic question. Let me switch my screen sharing back to the Capture One software and turn off the video so you'll be able to see quite profoundly that we actually have some great options there that we didn't cover during the presentation. One moment, please. And Allison, while I switch that over, would you mind uh, sharing the dates and locations for our upcoming, uh, upcoming open houses? Oh, yes, definitely. So we have, oh, we also have several questions coming in, so <laughs> hang tight. Um, we have two open houses happening um, in the next couple of weeks. We have one in our Culver City, uh, California studio location, which is on um, August 17th. It's, 17th. it's an open house. There will also be a uh, film scanning and I believe a stitching presentation by our very own Doug. Um, we are also having the same event in New York on August 24th and 25th. Um, so if you're in the New York area or can come up to the New York area, um, we'd happy, be happy to have you come in and take a look at all of this in person. Um, all of the information is on our dtdch.com website and registration information is there as well. So if you're in the area, definitely feel free to uh, come on by. Um, if you're not able to make those events, but you would like to set up a demo to see this in person, just let us know and we can set that up as well. Thanks, Austin. Awesome. So what I'm going to do now is demonstrate that we have the capability to have up to three focus meters and up to, I guess up to, and uh, up to three focus meters where one of them is the autofocus point of control. So we can only control based off of one of them, but we can feed back all three. Here I've placed three different readouts of different sizes in different locations, and I push autofocus, and we'll see all three of them respond at the same time. This can give us confirmation of the planarity of the objects to each other, as well as the planarity of the camera to the, ta to the table stage. So that, that provides us, for example, if there's any depth changes or any issues uh, with them not being in the same plane, whether because they're not physically in the same plane or because our camera is uh, tilted or pivoted on the, on the stand and needs to be calibrated. And here you can see all three reaching the same maximum value. 
let me place an object with some height into the frame and we'll be able to see uh, that that is not the case when we have objects of great depth. So here we have focus zone three is elevated by about an inch, so not a huge amount, uh, but subtle, uh, a large enough amount that it will clearly not be in the same plane of focus. The autofocus point is being controlled by zone one, and as I bring that into focus, we'll see that zone two, even though it's just black background, I actually removed the content from where that was, still is able to recognize that that's the best point of focus for that dark black background, which gives you some indication of the quality of the algorithm we're using. And then zone three, as you'll see, lags far behind its maximal point of focus. So we can see that plane uh, point three is not the same. Now the question actually asks, can we move the autofocus point, not just can we move the focus points? And so let me demonstrate that if I move this object, I don't have a good reason why you wouldn't move the object like this, but say it was a larger object and it had content in the top corner, and you wanted to use that as your autofocus point. Let me throw the focus off, and let me just indicate this as the point of focus. And here we see it's completed a successful autofocus, even though the object was in the top corner of the frame and not the center of the frame. Just because I'm a betting man and I like to run risks, let's also demonstrate autofocusing on pure white paper as opposed to something that has bite, contrast, or an obvious target. There's not much there for the autofocus routine to focus on, but because of the nature of the focusing mechanism that we're using and because of the algorithm that phase one has developed for this specific application, it's still able to attain focus here. Clearly, best practice would be to focus on an area that has obvious contrast, but as you can see where that's either not practical or you simply forget to, you'll also be able to achieve focus the vast majority of the time on pure paper white, or as you saw in the previous example, pure black table. So there are a couple of questions that are kind of um, grouped together, I think, um, from several different people. One is about um, what lens choices are available. And then the next question was, um, are extension tubes required, or is there extension for magnification built into the body? And then there was also a question about depth of field for the focus. So those are kind of all kind of tied together. Excellent. So let's talk about the lens availability. This comes with two purpose-driven cultural heritage lenses, the Schneider 72 millimeter Digitar. That lens is excellent for reproductions of approximately A4 and larger. And then we have the Schneider 120 millimeter aspheric lens, which is appropriate for objects of approximately A4 and smaller. So you could basically say a normal and a macro lens. And those lenses uh, are able to cover the full range all the way down to one-to-one -one magnification for objects approaching around the size of 645 film for resolutions in the several thousand PPI range. The, the mental math is case right now, but something like four or 5,000 PPI maximum. In order to achieve uh, extension, the body itself has a very long and accurate throw, which allows the 72 and 120 to both be used over a large range. However, there is also available 20 and 40 millimeter extension tubes for the 120 spirit, which allows that lens to be used over an even broader range, again, down to one to one. We have available a chart that provides each amount of extension required for which PPIs and which object sizes. Uh, but you'll find that there's quite a bit that can be done even before you get into the extension tube range, again, owing to the fact that it's got a very specific type of focusing mechanism known as a linear slide and not a normal rotary focus. Uh, as far as depth of field, uh, it should absolutely be said that the same depth of field here optically is going to be experienced as, for example, on the R cam or on any other camera. Uh, that is sort of an issue of optics, and it is a real and profound issue. That is, if you have a, uh, an object that has considerable depth, you cannot necessarily capture all that information in a single frame, uh, no matter what kind of camera you use. So I would point out a couple things. One is that focus stacking, which is built currently into the Phase 1 XF, and which is not currently built into the, not currently built into the Phase 1 IXG, uh, requires a couple things. It requires consistent, spaced, 
control focus point images. And we are able to accomplish that in this camera because we have registered focus distance and we also have control of the camera position. So focus backing, I believe, is one of the use cases that we uh, believe will become a very common scenario for the face on IXG uh, as we progress through and add additional features. Finally, the fact that you can place up more than one focus point allows you to very quickly ascertain where on the object is best to focus and whether or not the full range of that camera, uh, that subject can be focused at once. This camera, uh, as we presented at the Stanford hosted uh, imaging conference recently, is really built with computational photography in mind, whether that be photometry, multispectral, focus stacking, or other kinds of imaging that require computation. The computational realm we have seen just explode over the last few years, and we wanted to make sure that we built a camera that had the appropriate tool set to be able to build solutions for those uses. The next question is, um, are RCAM compatible camera backs, for example, the IQ3 compatible with the IXG system? If not, why was IXG designed as a one-piece unit? Allison, I, I might, or maybe I should take a shot at answering that question. Um, the IX system um, is not compatible with RCAM's uh, media format digital backs for a couple of reasons. Uh, when, when you're designing a camera that has that many automated features, you need to have a communication protocol between the focusing mechanism and the lens system and the digital back. Uh, in order to do that properly with extremely high precision that needs to happen with a more unibody design. Um, if I know this is going to sound a little salesy, but if you're interested in, in upgrading your existing RCAM and digital back, there's an upgrade path to the IXG system. And Peter, one of the reasons why that upgrade path exists is because the RCAM is going to continue as a product. Is that right? What is the state of and future of the TT RCAM? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a great camera, as we all know. It's very purpose built. Um, so we, we do plan on keeping that camera uh, on the market. There's no reason at all to discontinue that, that, that device at all. Allison, do we have an additional question? That was it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please feel free to email info at dtdch.com with any follow-up questions or contact your local salesperson. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye.